Welcome to Case in Point, produced by the University of Pennsylvania Law School. I'm Wendell Pritchett, Interim Dean of Penn Law and a Presidential Professor here at Penn. For this episode, we'll be looking at the future of American higher education and current and proposed models for reform. We'll also examine some of the most pressing challenges in higher ed, rising tuition costs and student loan debt, how well college and graduate and professional schools prepare students for the realities of the job market, issues of access, and how to assess the quality of education as well as outcomes at institutions. In short, the future of U.S. higher education is uncertain, so we're pleased to have with us experts who can provide some insights into what's working, what needs to be fixed, and where we may be headed. We're joined first by Laura Perna, a professor here at Penn's Graduate School of Education and the Executive Director of Penn's Alliance for Higher Education and Democracy. She's also the co-author of the book, The Attainment Agenda, State Policy Leadership in Higher Education. Also joining us from Washington, D.C. is Jeff Salingo, award-winning columnist, contributing editor to the Chronicle of Higher Education, and author most recently of the book, MOOC U, Who is Getting the Most Out of Online Education and Why? Thank you both for joining us. So, Laura, in your view, is higher education in crisis or merely, merely in flux? Is it just changing or are we really at a crisis period? I wouldn't call it a crisis, um, but I would say that higher education is facing some very important challenges and issues right now. On the one hand, um, higher education, I th there's a realization that higher education has never been more important to the individual and social, and our societal well-being. Um, economic and social prosperity clearly depend on having education beyond high school. At the same time, higher education is facing some important challenges. So we have increasing um, stratification of higher education opportunity in terms of who goes to college, who goes to what types of college. We have low completion rates for students who enroll. We have rising costs um, and other sorts of challenges that higher education is facing. Yeah, yeah there, are, there are a lot of them. Jeff, what do you think are some of the most uh, challenging uh, aspects of higher education right now? Well, I think some of it's in, in, in the control of colleges and universities. Um, and so that's, for example, uh, you know, rising costs, uh, uh, decreasing economic diversity among students is, is somewhat worrisome. But my biggest worry is actually somewhat out of the control of, of higher education, at least in the, in the short term, and that is the, uh, the job, we, have a, we have a recovery now with, with jobs, but, but, but wages haven't recovered, uh, particularly since uh, you know, the early 1990s. And so we essentially have a hollowing out of the middle class, and, and those are the students who will be coming to colleges, particularly now and in the, in the future, and they're going to demand of higher education more resources, uh, more educational resources and definitely more financial resources. And so for those students, higher education, even if it didn't increase its prices in the next couple of years, um, increasingly going to look out of reach um, to those students. And so that macroeconomic problem, to me, is a huge issue uh, for colleges and universities. Jeff, you spend a lot of time at universities. I mean, your, your, your terrific work you visited, I don't even know how many, maybe you could tell us how many universities. But can you give us a couple of examples of things that you're seeing on the ground that can kind of, you know, uh, exemplify the, the long-term challenge that you just described? Um, well, I think that most colleges and, and universities, and I've, you're right, I've visited probably hundreds in my career, both at the Chronicle and as a, as a, as a book author, you know, the, the issue of affordability is, is number one, uh, particularly on the agenda of, of, of mid-size colleges that are, you know, not in the, in the top tier because they are really facing pressure now because they're mostly dependent on, on tuition. So they're looking for new sources of revenue. Uh, they're looking for new people to donate to their annual uh, campaigns. And most important, uh, they're looking for efficiencies in how they deliver uh, uh, colleges or how they deliver education uh, to students. And so, and I think it's on that last piece that most colleges now are kind of experimenting. So this idea of, you know, competency-based education, you know, can we base uh, the concept of a degree instead of how much time you spend in a seat on what you know, and thus can we reduce the time to a degree. Uh, you know, a number of other institutions are, are experimenting with new types of bachelor's degrees. Again, that can be delivered 
in a shorter uh, amount of time. And then, of course, there is the big uh, promise, and I say promise and I underline that word, of technology and how technology might be able uh, to increase uh, efficiencies. And so far, we really haven't seen that, um, but we are seeing some hopeful signs, uh, especially around the idea of hybrid courses. Those are courses done half online and half face-to-face that we might be able to reduce the time of face-to-face interaction uh, with professors, which could potentially, could potentially, and I again underline that, reduce the cost of higher education over the long run. It seems to me that it really is a fertile period for, for universities in thinking about how to re-envision themselves. And we want to come back to some of the things you just mentioned, Jeff. But uh, Laura, what's, what's your sense? You also visit and talk to university leaders all the time. What's your kind of general sense of how they're looking at the world right now? And you know, do they really believe they have to change significantly? Or you know, is this just a, a period where we have to get through it? And you know, just kind of what's your sense of where people stand? Well, I think. Um Many institutions recognize that there are uh, the issues that Jeff mentioned. Um, you know, I think a particular concern of a number of institutions is trying to figure out how to maintain a mission, for example, a mission of serving students from many different backgrounds, while also trying to face these financial realities of um, you know trying to make a budget. Um, and you know, I think there's a real tension there and real issues with regard. I think the affordability issues for lower middle and middle class students are, are really problematic. And, and somehow we're going to have to figure out a way to address this. I think uh, in many instances, higher education leaders don't know what to do. And so the, you know, we're, and this is uh, the way of human nature, right? We're embedded in our context and you try to figure out, well, how to solve the problems of today rather than trying to figure out what a productive, more longer term strategy might be that might involve a, a way of doing things that's very different than what we're doing right now. Yeah, yeah. Well, and in, in your recent book, you, you talked about a lot of these issues and talked about a lot of different uh, efforts. And just kind of, could you give us a sense of, you know, what you think are the most important issues with regard to attainment? You know, in your book of the attainment agenda, you laid out a bunch of things. And, you know, just give us a pricey of it. And what are, what are some of the most important things you, you took from that? Sure. So in our study, we looked at um, the forces, and really we focused on the role of state policy in five different states. We looked at Georgia, Texas, Maryland, Illinois, and Washington. And we identified um, a number of policies that matter to increasing attainment. So certainly um, we have to have policies that are oriented towards ensuring the affordability of higher education. We have to have policies that are oriented towards ensuring that students can make the transition from K through 12 into higher education without the loss of credit. You know, right now, we're losing too many students as they have to, partic have to participate in developmental education before entering college level courses. Along that academic pipeline, we also have to improve the ability of students to move smoothly from uh, two-year to four-year institutions and just we have a lot of students who are transferring across institutions but in that process lose, losing credit. And then the third category of policies that we look at really pertains to the availability of different types of higher education institutions and opportunities and how those opportunities align with the needs of a population. And so some of that alignment might be um, where institutions are located compared to where the population centers are located and things like that. So policy, we conclude that policy matters, but we also really uh, come out strongly about the role of political leadership. And so um, what seems to be lacking right now is a clear public commitment or a, a policy orientation that um, improving higher education is a, a central priority and we have to orient our public policies towards achieving this goal. There's not one single policy that's going to magically solve our attainment um, problems right now. We have to have a more comprehensive approach. Yeah, yeah. And interestingly, the federal government is getting much more engaged in this, which we want to come back to uh, in a minute. Um, but, but first, Jeff, you, so you've re, uh, published a new book recently also. Um, and I'd love to hear your thoughts about online education and hybrid courses, as you, as you just mentioned. You know, there are a lot of people that think they are the solution. And I, I think the, one of the many great things about your book is that it's a pretty nuanced account. But if you could kind of describe to us how you look at online and hybrid education as part of the future of higher education. Well, and I think we have to define online and hybrid education in context, right? I think it's, it's critically important. We tend to describe online education in one way, and I think that gets, especially among the public, I think it gets somewhat 
um, um, confused. And so a number of institutions, nonprofit institutions, do online education uh, very well. A number of other institutions are experimenting and more than experimenting at scale. They now have uh, hybrid courses as part of the, the general curriculum and studies done by uh, Ithaca SNR have shown that the outcomes of those courses are pretty similar, whether they're taught uh, face to face or in uh, in a hybrid uh, hybrid setting, and then of course recently we've talked a lot about MOOCs, massive online uh, open courses, which people I think conflate with you know the quality and, and substance of online courses that might be taught in a more closed setting on a uh, on a college campus. And Laura has done a uh, a number uh, a lot of work I know in this area on MOOCs. In fact, I, I use some of her research in my in my most uh, in my most recent book. And the conclusion I came to in in, uh, in MOOC U is that a lot of the people um, using MOOCs or who have taken MOOCs from whether it's Coursera or edX uh, or um, uh, uh, you know, Udacity uh, already have college degrees and they're using it um, very much like the way any of us might use YouTube or something else. You know, we're trying to fix something on a weekend or try to cook dinner tonight and we don't quite know how to do something. And, you know, we Google something and we find a YouTube video and want to learn quickly how to, how to do something. And, and in many ways, I found that's how MOOCs are being used. They're, they're being used as what I call just-in-time education for somebody who needs to be trained in something or needs to be refreshed in something that they might have learned uh, in college and that might be 10, 15, 20, 30, uh, 30 years ago. And they come in, uh, they, they watch perhaps one or two lectures, maybe they do some of the readings, but they don't necessarily take the whole course. And that's why you know, the completion rates in MOOCs have been uh, uh, fairly low. Um, and I'm not quite sure we should measure them. Uh, the same way we measure uh, completion in traditional colleges and universities because the intention of those students is very different uh, than the intention of students uh, who might go to a place like Penn or elsewhere where they actually are coming not only for the credential but to take uh, the full course. And so I think it's important as we think of whether it's online education or the MOOCs or hybrid education to really put it in the context of the institution um, that's offering it and, and most important to put it in the context of the student. You know, are they the traditional undergraduate 18 to 24 year old? Are they the returning adult who actually needs a degree? Or are they the millions of people out there like probably all of us who lifelong education is now critical and you know, we're trying to learn new skills on the fly all the time and trust me, as a, as, a, as a student like that, I love having the MOOCs available because, again, if I need to learn something quickly and easily, you know, it takes me a couple of minutes to sign up for a course and I could get what I need when I need it. So lifelong education is a wonderful thing. And, and my wife just re recently fixed our uh, kitchen faucet by going to YouTube. Um, and so she saved us a couple hundred bucks. So I, I'm strongly supportive of that. <laughs> Um, but uh, if we're really focused on the kind of students that Laura has been writing about, I know that all three of us are interested in, I was wondering if, if both of you could talk a little bit about how we can use technology. So let's broaden it out to just technology uh, to help the, the students who are less prepared, who are coming to college. Let's talk about the 18 to 24 year olds, but the ones that are coming to college less prepared and really need a bunch of support um, and also need financial assistance to get through. So what, what do you both think, Laura, I'll uh, go to you first. What kinds of things can technology do to help that group of people? So I think technology has the potential to play a role for that group. Um, and so just to reiterate one of the things that Jeff was suggesting, you know, part of the problem right now is that we've sort of, when we say online or we say MOOCs, we sort of lump everything together. But we have really important different types of needs for different communities. If we're trying to think about how to improve college access and attainment for students transitioning right from high school, you know, I think there is a potential role for technology to play with regard to improving access to high quality courses in high school. And, you know, because we have such tr tremendous variation right now in terms of the resources that are available in high schools. You know, your, out your life outcomes depend on where you live and the high school you attend, the availability of rigorous coursework, the availability of information about how you navigate college. And so I think there is a potential role there for technology to play in helping to, um, you know, I'm an optimist, helping to bridge some of that gap. I also have been thinking about the role of technology um, in trying to identify students who need help sooner. 
You know, I think there's potential in some of the analytics, the data analytics conversations and uh, uses that are going on right now. You know, we ha we're collecting so much data in so many aspects of our lives, and I think here is a potential perhaps to intentionally collect data that might be helpful to identify students who are struggling early on and then use other types of interventions to reach out and say, hey, we, found, we know that you're struggling. These are sorts of things that we can do or adapt the, um, the learning and the, the teaching that's going on at that point to help improve in, um, attainment and outcomes for students. Great, yeah, I, I agree with you. There, there are a lot of ways, but we have to be very targeted. Jeff, what are, what are your thoughts on this? What are well, some and things? And I think that's the, the difficult part here is I think that um, uh, particularly around technology, there's a lot of promise, but for a vast majority of, of students, we know from the research, particularly for generation students and, and lower income students, and students in general really um, uh, uh, succeed because of, of high impact practices. And most of those high impact practices in education um, are with people, right? Um, you know, the more one-on-one -on -one interactions you have um, with professors, the more mentoring you have, you know, that can be facilitated in some ways by technology. It can be helped by technology and perhaps even as, as Laura suggests with analytics so we know where to direct certain interventions by human beings. But I think that too many people think that technology is going to be the replacement and it just can't be. Um, I think that Sebastian Thrun, you know, the founder of, of Udacity, you know, one of the, the big time MOOC professors, you know, realized this uh, years ago when he really thought uh, along with San Jose State University that they could, you know, kind of essentially replace uh, professors there with the Udacity courses. And he discovered that, you know, the MOOCs really don't work for the vast majority, the as he says, the 95% of students out there who, who need help and, and is particularly need help with, with, with faculty members and great faculty members. So where I think technology can help is, is many of the things that, that Laura just outlined where it's used as a, um, in conjunction with, uh, with professors and other teachers, but not as a replacement. We've got this pretty big challenge as a result. We've got, as Jeff mentioned, students who are coming in with more financial need than the past student body. And at the same time, they have more needs for resources, non-financial resources than past student bodies. Right? So that's, that's a pretty big confluence of negative uh, challenges. Uh, let's talk about the, the federal government's intervention over the last few years. So as you both know, the federal government has actually increased its support for higher education dramatically in, in the last decade. It really is something that's kind of not talked about by people other than those of us in higher ed, and even some of us in higher ed don't really want to give it as much attention, maybe, because we're worried about it changing, right? Um, but the president has continued to engage in higher education policy and recently, as you both know, proposed uh, making community college free. Uh, and I'd love to get your reaction to that specific proposal, but also just to um, federal role, the appropriate federal role in higher education. So, Laura, you have some thoughts on both those big questions. Sure. Um, so I think that the um, proposal, at least has been outlined so far, has some interesting and um, promising aspects to it. So I like the idea of having the federal government um, specify a, a relative contribution that it will make towards funding the cost of higher education um, and using um, that as incentive for states to also um, contribute to the cost of higher education. And one of the problems with um, the rising costs, rising tuition in recent times has been, you know, that's in response to a declining state appropriation per student. And so, you know, somehow we have to um, have a conversation as a country about what the relative responsibility is of the federal government, state governments, institutions, and students and family in paying the cost of higher education. And so I'm, I think that this could be a potential mechanism for helping to have that important contribution and outlining a potential approach to that. Thanks. Jeff, what are your thoughts? Well, on the community college uh, proposal specifically, I, I, you know, in a Republican-controlled Congress, I don't think it's necessarily going to go anywhere. But I think it's a, it's an important, as Laura just said, a, a conversation starter. And where I think it's an important conversation starter is what is the level, what's the basic level of conversation or of of education that um, American citizens need today? Um, and you know, the the high school movement uh, of a century ago really coincided with this idea 
that, you know, of the new child labor laws where people were going to be uh, much more focused on being in school as adolescents uh, than in, in the workforce. And now we see there's this whole new uh, school of thought on emerging adulthood that people in their 20s, you know, need more time to kind of launch into careers and launch into life. And, you know, the economy today, I think, demands more schooling, to be perfectly honest, than, than th the 13 years we have. And so this idea of a free community college to me means that perhaps we could finally have this conversation that perhaps two years of college should be almost a minimum uh, for, for students just like we thought uh, a century ago that high school uh, was a needed minimum for, for young people um, in this country. Second, on, in terms of federal investments in, in higher education, I agree they've been huge. Uh, by the Obama administration. Unfortunately, I still don't think they're at the scale that we need. The problem is enormous. Um, we need to increase the educational attainment of our country overall. I think it's, it's important for the economy. It's important to compete in a global society. And probably most important, it's, in, it's most important for our, the future of our, our democracy. And, and even what it has done, to be honest with you, is, is a drop in the bucket. Um, for what is needed. And I, I go back to uh, demographics and, and, and the future students of our, of our country. And, um, and there was uh, the Chronicle a couple months ago did a piece on, on kind of the four-year-olds of, of the U.S. and what it's going to be like when they get to college. And, and one of the things it found is that of the 450 counties in the U.S., there are 450 counties in the U.S. that have more young people than old people. And all but 100 of them, so 350 of them, have a lower median income than the national um, median today, right? So these are, you know, poor students who are going to need, who are really coming down the pipeline. And I think not only are many colleges and universities not prepared for this, I think as a country as a whole, um, we're not prepared for this. No, again, it is a serious challenge, and I do want to try to go back to some positive things that are coming out of this challenge. But yes. you know, as as, as a follow-up to what Jeff just said, you know, uh, one of the many challenges is well, where do we allocate resources, even among our higher education infrastructure? Right. So uh, I think you both agree that there's a lot of research that helping people at age four, helping kids at age four, is fundamental. Uh, to their success o o over their whole lives. And so another question, you know, even if we were allocating more dollars to education, is higher education the right place to spend that money? Um, because, you know, we, we have a lot of evidence that if we can really help kids when they're two, three, and four, they're going to be more successful. So uh, I'm not going to make you, but either one of you address that one. I'll just, just raise it. Laura, you've done a lot of research uh, and policy uh, advice uh, advising about college access and how to increase access. Where do you think we stand on this issue of, of college access? We've, it's gotten a lot of attention. Um, have we made progress? In what ways? What have, we, what have we learned? So I think we've made progress in terms of college access. More and more students are going to college. We also have a good understanding of what um, the important forces are and barriers to successful access are. So we know that academic readiness matters. We know that finances matter. We know that information matters. So in our uh, large, diverse higher education system, we have so many different college options available, and we have a complex system of paying for that. And so we need information does matter to student success. And we know that support from individuals does matter. Um, we also have more and more research that's looking at the role of particular types of policies and programs and intervening for particular types of groups. And I think that research has been important in trying to identify what effective interventions are. I think what we uh, need more of in terms of the available research is um, understanding how policies and programs work together and in different contexts and for different types of individuals. So, um, you know, how what really matters is overall affordability for college, for example, but affordability is determined by a family income, it's determined by state appropriations, it's, it's, de it's determined by tuition, it's determined by financial aid. And so understanding more how those different levers can come together to shape college access and choice as well as completion really matters. Great, great. And, and I do think that the, the president's 
community college proposals are trying to address a couple of aspects of those questions, but they're, they're not addressing all of them. Um, and of course, Jeff, you know, not, it's not only about access, but it's about what happens in college and what happens after college. And you recently wrote uh, about the bachelor's degree and how it needs a makeover. And I'd love if you can share some thoughts about, about that aspect of our higher education infrastructure. So when you think about it, you know, 40, 50 years ago when fewer people needed a bachelor's degree to succeed, at least economically, um, in this country, you used to go to college to kind of get that broad education. You'd come out, you'd go to professional school to focus on one discipline or, or graduate school, uh, or you'd go into the workplace where they would train you um, in, a, in a specific uh, field. Now we expect those two things um, to happen in tandem, uh, kind of the, the practical training and the liberal arts, which is why on many campuses we kind of have rigorous debates, um, especially among the faculty, uh, between, those two, uh, between those two things. And at the same time, we expect a lot more experiential learning, right? So we want students out on internships and study abroad and undergraduate research. And as, as Laura just mentioned about academic preparation, we still have a lot of students coming to college not academically prepared for college. And so they're having to take uh, remedial courses. And we expect all of this to happen um, in four years. And in fact, there's even more pressure now um, from lawmakers, both at the federal and the state level, uh, to graduate in, in four years. And I think the time has really come to kind of rethink the bachelor's degree. What should it be? What should it be by discipline? Um, what should it be by, by institution? And we have a number of people, I think, you know, thinking about these. I, I mentioned in, in, in the piece I just recently wrote uh, about an effort at uh, Stanford University out of their design school uh, to rethink um, the undergraduate education, not as a box you come into for four years, but more as a platform. So when you're accepted to a place like Stanford, instead of getting access to four years of education, you get access to six years of education that you can use throughout any time in your life. They call it the open loop uh, university, uh, uh, an effort at Arizona State where I'm a, a professor of practice. Uh, this fall, they're going to be piloting um, six majors through a pilot program for a project-based, competency-based degree, which they just got several million dollars from the education department to, to pilot. And the idea behind this is, again, kind of mixing the experiential part of education and the classroom part. Uh, because I think just on too many campuses, we see those as two very separate things. Um, yet in society and in the economy, we demand both. And, uh, and so, again, I think there's a number of people kind of rethinking what, what it means to have a bachelor's degree and what is the signal that should send to uh, the broader economy and, and the broader society about what it means to have a, a bachelor's degree. It, it is interesting we've been having that debate, professional versus general education, for a long time. Um, but now it is in a very different context. And I think some, some of us are starting to understand the context, but there are a lot of people who are still having the same, same debate. Um, and I wonder. You could do, and, and that's the problem. Yeah. I think that there's we we see it too often as an either or, um, when it should be a both and. And and I think that's what we need to focus on. How do we get both the broad education, which we know is necessary, especially in an economy that's changing drastically, but also give people um, and students real skills that they can use um, on day one of gra uh, after graduation. Yeah, yeah, th thanks, thanks for that follow-up. And, and, and that, that leads me to a follow-up, which is that we know that there's some really good experimentation going on, but what do you both think are the prospects for you know, system-wide reform? Or you know, how, how do we expand reform past the few places that are really trying to be innovative? Like, Laura, do you have some thoughts about you know, what, what is it gonna take to really see significant higher education reform? It's such a great question because we do have innovative practices that are going on in isolated pockets and in different places. We've had trouble bringing uh, those types of reforms to scale. I think a, uh, a few things. So one would be uh, leadership. Yeah, I think so that's one thing. We have to be willing to invest in reform and um, it's going to cost some money to fund reform. I think there also has to be a willingness to try them, some things and not have them be right. Right? And so not every, every type of reform will be necessarily effective the first time, but we have to be able to take some risks. 
as a faculty member, I can probably criticize the faculty. I'm the one to criticize the faculty on this. A lot of uh, reforms require a change in the way that faculty think about their work, uh, may require additional training and um, expertise, and really taking some ownership in some of the practices that are um, part of higher education right now that perhaps warrant some rethinking. Yeah, uh, Jeff, I want to invite you to answer the same question, but maybe we could also segue to talking about the, the president's proposed uh, college rating system, uh, which I think the administration thinks will help on this question. I, I don't know what, what opinion you have on that, but maybe first you could talk about just kind of where you see the landscape of higher ed reform, and then, again, we could also talk about the, the college rating uh, proposed. So, right, so I agree with Laura. There's definitely innovation. I think um, higher education gets a bad rap um, for being too slow to change and not being very innovative, and I agree that, you know, again, on the campuses I visited, they're, they're doing really interesting things, but again, sometimes it's in you know, one school, one department, or a corner of campus. It's not in the what I would describe as the central academic core uh, of, of the institution. And I think there are two things to blame for that uh, often. One is accreditation. Um, you know, accreditation, I think, does uh, keep up the quality of American higher education, but it also, I think, sometimes stifles uh, uh, innovation, whether that's uh, the regional accreditors or the, or the specialized accreditors. And then second is regulation um, uh, at the, both the federal level and at the state level, but particularly at the, at the federal level. And again, I understand what the federal regulators are trying to do. They're trying to protect students and they're trying to protect you know, federal dollars that they're using, but sometimes um, that comes at the expense of, uh, of, of true innovation. And I think that's what the president is trying to do with his rating system is to try to encourage um, not only more innovation, but, but to try to give the public at large uh, a way to um, uh, to di differentiate between um, institutions using more than just the U.S. News and World Report rankings or other rankings that we have out there. I think what they're, trying to, what they're seeing, though, as they try to do this, is that it's a lot more difficult than uh, people think it is uh, to put these rankings together. And we saw that you know, a couple of weeks ago. They came out with the first cut at the rankings, which really weren't um, anything more than a framework that they, uh, that they want to use. Um, and uh, I think this is... I, th I think what this is going to do is, again, very much like his community college proposal, it's going to spur very important conversations, but I don't think in the end, in two years, we're either going to have the rankings or are we going to have free community college. Uh, so I don't think either thing is really going to go anywhere, but I think both things are going to spur important conversations that four, five, or ten years from now uh, might result in, in changed policies. So there are, there are several themes that we've been discussing. One of them is about the role of leadership, which I want to come back to in a second. But an, another one is just what are our values? What is the role of higher education? I think, as Jeff said, and Laura, you, you've also said, uh, we, don't, we, we have so many demands of higher education. There's so many things that we want from it. And it's not a surprise then that uh, it might not be as focused. The, uh, the institutions might not be as focused as some of us might, might like. We have so many expectations. We want so many things out of it. And you know, how do we foster the discussion uh, that will get us to some shared goals, some shared values for higher education. And then, uh, second question, you know, is how do we gather support around financing, providing the resources for them? Um, you know, as you look at the Higher Education Act, I mean, that, that was a moment when the Higher Education Act was originally passed where we did have some conversation about those things. What are, what are our values? What's the role of higher education? And how do we support it as a country? And you know, as, as you both know, uh, it's up for reauthorization. Uh, and I'd love for you both to comment, uh, start with Laura, about where do you see that going? Um, and is it uh, uh, an opportunity to have this discussion about what are our values and what do we hope to get out of higher education? What, what, what do you think, Laura? I don't know. Um, you know, as we look at the conversations in Congress right now, I don't know. Um, what will happen and or the nature of the how productive the conversations will be. I did have the opportunity to testify as part of the hearings for the reauthorization in July to the Senate Health Committee on the role of federal state partnerships. And so I was excited, you know, that there's that theme again of thinking about, well, what is the role of the federal government and state government in thinking about um, how we support higher education moving forward. So I'm optimistic about that. Um, you know, I really hope that there's something that happens with regard to the simplification of the process of filing for financial aid. I think that's an important issue that could be addressed that would make a big difference. But um, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Jeff, what are your thoughts? 
Um, I, again, I hate to be negative. Uh, uh, well, first of all, I think that many pieces of reauthorization have actually been addressed in other pieces of legislation or regulatory changes by both the administration and by Congress over the last couple of years. So this idea of using the Higher Education Act as a broad vehicle for change, um, I think, has been diminished in some ways by those, uh, by those changes. I think the one big piece that could happen is, is as Laura mentioned, is financial aid uh, simplicity, uh, uh, simplification, I should say. Um, you know, that's a big issue of, uh, of Senator Alexander, who's now uh, chairing the Senate uh, uh, Health Committee and, and is a big advocate of that uh, in, uh, in the Senate. So I think, that, I think that's one change um, we're likely to see. But, but, you know, these conversations about what we hope and dream for American higher education, unfortunately, haven't happened in a, in a, in a very long time. Um, and, uh, and I really wish it would, because I think particularly when we think about the future of public universities in this country, you know, we're 80 percent of Americans go to a public college or, or university. Essentially, we have been privatizing them uh, over the last uh, a couple of decades. And, and unfortunately, I don't think we're having a, a, the conversation we need um, about who should pay and how they should pay and how much they should pay. Um, and that's, that, that used to be happened through the, the Higher Education Act. And, and unfortunately, I just don't think that's going to happen this time around. Yeah, no, I, I share your concern. Lori, did you want to add something? It seemed like you had an additional thought you wanted to share. No, I think Jeff's right. You know, I, I wish we were more optimistic. As you both know, uh, there have been a fair number of people who have questioned whether college is worth it. Uh, and they wonder what the return on investment is and whether we should be spending, and people, individuals, should be spending money on college. And I'm interested in what, what the two of you think about this question. You know, is college worth it? I think I know where you stand, so let me ask a follow-up question, which is how do students uh, and their parents help them make college worth it? Um, Laura, do you have some thoughts on both those questions? Sure. So, yes, I completely agree that college is worth it. When you, we look at the earnings premiums that are associated with completing a bachelor's degree, um, they, they're going up. The other earnings lines are staying flat. And so the premium associated with completing a college degree really demonstrates for me the value of college. And the benefits in terms of earnings and in unemployment and employment, they persisted even in the economic downturn, even though there were some challenges that college graduates experienced. So college is clearly worth it. In terms of figuring out how to maximize investment, um, you know, part of that is figuring out how to make choices that are right for a family's circumstances with regard to paying for college. And so um, where some students get into trouble is in terms of taking on excessive loan debt um, and, you know, really figuring out, so the, sel the sources of self-pay are loans and work. And so figuring out that balance between loans and work to pay for college is part of that equation. Thanks. Jeff, what are your thoughts on this question? Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't even know why we debate this sometimes. I mean, yes, college is worth it. Um, I think that uh, I think the bigger question is um, when you have a when you have a choice of colleges, and unfortunately, too many students don't have enough choice um, in, in in where they can go to college. Is what is the best institution for me? Um, you know, where am I uh, less likely to take on excessive debt? Where am I more likely to graduate, um, particularly if I'm a first-generation student or a low-income student or a student of color? You know, I, I think that students, that's, in some ways, that's the information I hope that uh, the president's report card could shine more of a light on in terms of the institutions that are successful with students like me if I'm looking for, uh, for an institution. And then once you get there, I think it has a lot to do, it has a lot less to do with what you major in. I've been talking to employers a lot lately about their hiring practices. And, you know, they're not really that interested in a student's GPA and major for the most part. Um, you know, they're really interested in what students do while they're there, um, you know, and, and, and the rigorous uh, courses they take. Uh, the time on task, you know, how much time they spend, you know, studying and writing and leading groups and, and doing work outside the classroom, whether it's in internships or study abroad or undergraduate uh, uh, research. So it's really kind of um, uh, really focused on both those inside and outside the classroom experiences that, again, I think are apparent and are available at all different types of colleges and universities, I think it's really how you take advantage of them um, once you're there and, and how do we measure that. And that's, I think, something we don't really know um, and we don't, we don't, and most colleges don't do a very good job at. They're very good at giving you anecdotes, but, um, but we need to better measure that in the future 
so that students and parents could better differentiate between institutions. That, that's really helpful advice, Jeff. Um, and as you both know, and we see it on a daily basis, there are literally thousands of students who navigate the, this process really well um, and come out with a meaningful education that really transforms their lives. So even though we know we have a lot of challenges and we've talked about them, um, we, we still have had a lot of success. And, and I wonder if we could end, uh, but I, I want, want to ask each of you to say something, talk about something briefly that excites you about the next five years or 10 years in the higher education field, something that you think is is really has the potential to help us do even more in this field. And Laura, I'll start with you. Such a good question. Um, I guess I'm excited about the conversations that are happening. I'm optimistic about this. You know, I think that with some of the trends in tuition and whatnot, we're really getting to a point where we have to figure this out. And the fact that there are conversations happening in this area suggests that to me um, that we will. Thank you. Jeff? What are your thoughts? Um, you know, Laura mentioned earlier the importance of leadership around change, and that's where I'm most excited. I, I've gotten the opportunity over the last year or so to meet um, kind of the next, what I would see as next generation of leaders of our colleges and universities. These are the next generation of college presidents. You know, they're the, the provosts and the vice provosts and the deans today. And the conversations they're having and how they're rethinking higher education is, is, is incredibly exciting to me. They're, they're, they're ready to dive into this problem and solve it um, once, they get the, once they get the chance. And so I, I'm really excited about the next generation of leaders that we're going to have in, in higher education. Thank you both for sharing those those optimistic views, and and thank you both for for your great participation, um, not only in this conversation but in all of the work that you're doing to help us move forward in higher education. Uh, this was a really great conversation, and I'm grateful to both of you. It was great to be here. Thank you. Thank you.